from time to time they have these uh, lists that come out on the internet, world's dumbest criminals, and those always interest me, so I click on them and I read through the different uh, dumb criminals that have done stupid things throughout history. One is I just always want to make sure, like, none of them ever say Elliot. Like, I don't have a lineage of, like, dumb criminals in my family that I didn't know about. So just always want to make sure that that is not there. And once I'm, uh, you know, done looking through that and I realize there's none of them there, then I just start to read some of the examples. And one of them was just, it was just so ridiculous. His name was Mark Wheeler, and it was in April of 1995. I think the dude lived in Pittsburgh, and he thought, I'm going to go rob some banks. So I'm going to go rob a couple banks. He hits two banks, walks in with a gun to the bank, no mask, no anything, walks up to the counter, gets money, goes to another bank, does the exact same thing, no mask, no other, doesn't shoot the cameras, does nothing, walks out, goes back to his house, I think. I think it was his house or his apartment, and just thinks that he's okay. Uh, the police went to the cameras and pulled the camera and pulled the picture. They put it everywhere. I think they might have even put it on the evening news. They just plastered it everywhere. And within like hours, he was caught. And when they showed up to his house, he was incredulous. He couldn't believe he got caught. And he said this phrase, I, I wore the juice. I wore the juice. And like, what are you talking about? He says, I put lemon juice on my face so no cameras could see me. The dude thought that if I put lemon juice on my face, it would make it invisible. And here was his logic. Sometimes they use lemon juice for invisible ink. So if I rub it on my face, it will make it invisible. Okay? He, he detailed how it came about. And he said, yeah, it really hurt my eyes when I put it on my face. Of course, like that's what lemon juice does. But he said, I, I took a Polaroid of myself and it worked. And they were trying to figure it out. Their, their best guess is something like, you know, if you take a selfie with a Polaroid and you're holding it out here and you're really excited to see the results, if you shake it so fast, your face would appear blurry in the picture that comes out and you would go, look, it worked, it did that. The self-deception of this guy of thinking I'm okay caused him to do extremely foolish things. Self-deception can be so, so dangerous. The Bible presents this morning a picture of a different form of self-righteousness, but one that is similarly dangerous. And if you got your Bibles, go with me to Romans chapter 2, and we're going to see how dangerous this self-deception can be. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And what we're going to see in this text is that Paul has transitioned from condemning the world in general to honing in on a very specific Group And as he does this, he hones in on the self-deception of self-righteousness that causes people to miss their need for the gospel and think that they're okay with God. If you think back to that example of MacArthur Wheeler, if he's convinced himself, okay, his logic is sound, I, I am blind to any camera, no one can see me, how would you convince him otherwise? He is so self-deceived. When you take a look at self-righteousness in the Bible, it leads to a self-deception that I do not need God's grace or his kindness, but I'm okay without it because I've attached it to something else, my status, my ethnicity, my goodness, whatever it is, there is a self-deception to self-righteousness that hinders people from seeing the gospel. Follow along with me as I read Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, which says this, therefore... You have no excuse, O oh man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things, yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume upon the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. The subtle deception, the self-deception of self-righteousness is so difficult. Why is it good for us to study this? Well, because 
If we consider ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ sent out into the world to proclaim his great gospel, to bring people into the kingdom of God, like Jesus was saying during our Bible reading, repent and believe because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If that is our commission from our king, we've got to know the clientele that we're going to. Last week, we saw that there is a group of people, Paul was condemning the the entire world for uh, falling under the condemnation of sin because they've given themselves up to a depraved mind to do these bad things. And You can probably appeal to the conscience of those people, and if they really think about it, they will agree with you, yeah, cheating on my wife is bad, getting angry is bad, lying is bad, stealing is bad, I agree this deserves punishment. And you know why you would get them to agree? Because if somebody did it to them, they wouldn't just go, oh, that's okay, that's fine. No, they hurt me, my wife cheated on me, my wife lied to me, my wife did this, that's fine. Nobody would do that because they have this internal conscience, this sense of of righteousness and justice. But that's not the only type of person that you're gonna meet when you go out and share the gospel. It will not just be those people who proceed to sin and sin more and not only do they sin, but they applaud other people who do it. There will be a group of people you go out to and they are morally good people. They might actually be religious people who show up to some sort of form of church and put religious practices into their lives each and every week and, oh, I'm good, I don't... I don't need to hear about God's saving grace. I don't need to talk about his righteousness. I'm in agreement with you. These people are bad, but their life is not marked by repentance. And these people are self-righteousness. And here is the danger of self-righteousness. It blinds you to your own sin, and it boosts the offensiveness of other people's sins. So it's easy for you to point the finger out there without ever taking a look into your own Life, if we're taking the gospel out to people who have this self-righteous attitude, we need to know how to fight against it and we better guard against it in our own lives because if we think as Christians that there is no temptation towards self-righteousness, then we're fooling ourselves and we never want to do that. What does Paul say here? Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who... Judges. So Paul has made this shift here, right? We saw that he was talking to the world in general in 18 to 32 of chapter 1, condemning them under sin. And notice how he did that. Because all humanity is created in the image of God and owes God what he created humanity to do, which is give him worship. But rather than acknowledging God and his glory and receiving his truth, they chose to accept lesser glory and lies and devote themselves to these deplorable practices that they even of themselves would at the end of this say, yeah, you know what, I understand why this would earn God's judgment, but I don't care and I'm going to give hearty approval to people who do so. But like I said last week, Paul is such a brilliant writer because he knows, being a Jew himself, that as he's condemning the world, what he might have alongside him is a group of people who are going, yeah, Paul, you are absolutely right. Those Gentiles are so disgusting. Can you believe what they do? Get them, Paul. You're doing it absolutely right. And Paul's now going to turn and point the finger to them and say, Wait a second, you guys, you have no excuse. He's going to point out the self-righteousness and the self-deception that is associated with it. So if you got your outline, number one, I want you to write it down this way. Understand the danger of self-righteousness. Understand the danger of self-righteousness. It will cause a judgmental spirit. And this judgmental spirit will put others down and promote yourself It will blind you to your own sin and it will boost the offensiveness of sins of others. And if you are a gospel witness, you will have no hope of giving them the right gospel because you're going to teach them the gospel of self-justification, which is never true. But if they are self-righteous, you've got to know how to come at them. So understand the danger of it. So notice how Paul begins to talk to them. Therefore, you have no excuse. What What an interesting phrase right there. Do you remember... That's exactly what Paul said in Romans 1 to the Gentiles. They can look out at creation and they can see that God did this. There is something great that put this together. This doesn't make sense as a random accident or a chance happening. Somebody designed this with a purpose. And so Paul says, Romans 1.20, therefore you are without excuse. 
But now he turns to the self-righteous Jew and goes, guess what, guys? You are without excuse. Because remember how he said it with general revelation. The Gentiles ignore general revelation, which can show that there is a God, but not show you how to know that God. I think the Jews here are making a far worse uh, mistake, maybe even sin against God, as they have received special revelation and they ignore what it says about them. Special revelation from God is his word communicated to them. And God in his covenant told them how to be justified, never by works where I could be self-righteous and depend on myself, but only by his grace. And that's why Paul will argue with the Jews later on through the Old Testament over and over again, justification is by grace through faith. One text, let me just read it to you. It's going to be there uh, later on in the book of Romans. Romans 3, 1 Uh, says this, what advantage is there to being a Jew? Or what value is there of circumcision? Much in every way to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So Paul here, when he says the phrase, oh man, he is building up a a fake opponent that he's going to have an interaction with. He's going to have an argument with this guy because he's using this fake guy to be a representative of what the entire nation of Israel, outside of those who have really put their faith in the gospel, are presently uh, living a a life of self-deception. So it's called a a form of diatribe. I'm going to create this character and I'm going to go back and forth with questions so that you see your logic is actually not sound and you should adopt what I am saying to try to get them out of their self-righteousness. And notice what their self-righteousness causes them to do. Three times he's used this word, judge or judgment. Therefore, you, man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, judgment language, because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. Now, it's very interesting when we get to the form of the self-deception of self-righteousness. It leads to this judgment but it's not any it's not just a a general form of judgment it's a very specific form of judgment it's called hypocritical judgment because you are practicing the very same thing that you are condemning other people of doing what does that mean specifically well it's not necessarily agreed upon with the commentators what is Paul referencing when he says you are practicing the very same thing some just attach it to what we looked at last week just the the previous statement and you can look at all of those things that we talked about in verse 29 they're filled with unrighteousness evil covetousness malice you go through all those different things gossips uh, anger bitterness arrogant proud boastful all of those things that the Jews condemn others for doing it could be that they are actually practicing those things themselves and it matches what Jesus condemned the Pharisees for doing in Mark chapter 7 right out of the heart comes adultery boastful slander all of these things so it comes from the outside So Jesus' view of the law and the fact that it doesn't just have to be you committing the act of adultery, but you even having a lustful thought could condemn them under this. But I don't think it's just specifically that. Here's what I think they're in danger of doing. It is the idolatrous thinking that leads to the immoral living. So it's not just the immoral living that is the very same things, but it is the idolatrous thinking that Paul was condemning the Gentiles for having You have set up these idols and that causes you to live this way. Notice this with self-deception. You build yourself up with idolatrous thinking. Why? Because when you set yourself up as the judge, you become the idol. You're the standard. You're the one who brings condemnation. You're the one who is the judge, jury, and sentencer. And when you are that, you are in a category all by yourself, James chapter 4 says, There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. And that is God. And so when you lift yourself up to the position of God and you do what God does, you have now made yourself an idol. And that's where their self deception comes in. I now am the judge and I am not under condemnation. You are under condemnation while I'm actually practicing that exact. Same thing, it's the hypocrisy of this judgment. So I think it's the idolatrous thinking that leads to immoral 
living. Notice where he goes in verse two, okay? So he says, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. So Paul has moved from the second person to now the first person. He's gonna include himself, which is why we think he's starting with the Jewish people. Paul himself was a Jew. He knows what it's like to be self-deceived. Philippians 3 says, I was self-deceived, thinking I was righteous myself. So he knows this. So he goes, hey, let's just think about something that we would all agree on. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things, okay? So if I have somebody who is an idolater, idolatrous in their thinking that leads to their immoral living, then you and I both know that God is going to judge that person, right? We're in agreement on that. So Paul's establishing a baseline. And any Jew would agree with this statement. Let me just give you one verse to write down. Psalm 96, 13. Psalm 96, 13. And listen to this statement. Psalm 96, 13. The Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in faithfulness or truth. So every Jew would agree that, of course, God is going to come and he's going to judge the world in his righteousness. And God sets the standard for righteousness. We, the Jews, have received that standard in the law. We know what it is. Of course, he's going to judge the world that way. So Paul's getting them to agree to this fact. But if you look at our verse, that God, the judgment of God rightly falls upon those in the Greek, it would say something like God judges them according to truth. So it is God's standard, it is his truth that is going to be the final arbiter, the final judge that these people who practice such things will receive judgment. You and I are on the same page, right? Oh, a fictitious Jewish character that he's bringing up here. Now watch where he goes in verse three. Do you suppose, as you're talking to people who are self-righteous, you have to ask them good questions. Isn't it interesting, uh, you guys who are in Dwell Richly, what did God do with Jonah in chapter four in his self-righteousness? He sets him up with a plant, right? And he just asks him a question. Jonah is in a frenzy because his hypocritical, hateful heart just saw people get saved and he hates it. God, take my life. So he sets up a plant and, God, and Jonah loves this plant and it helps him with everything. God takes away the plant and Jonah gets angry again and does God go, look, you are self-righteous? He goes, hey, Jonah, do you do well to be angry? You want to talk to a self-righteous person, you got to ask them questions. you got to get them to say out loud what they are doing. Because if you point it out, they're not going to hear it. But to get them to answer the question is going to hopefully bring light to their eyes do you suppose, oh man, you who judge those while practicing the very same things, that you will escape the judgment of God? Do you see the beautiful line of logic that Paul is saying? You agree that anybody who practices this is going to be judged by God. So do you think that you are going to escape that judgment? And if the Jew comes back and goes, oh wait, I'm part of the covenant people of God, Paul's gonna be able to point out later it doesn't matter if you are ethnically a part of a people. What matters is are you spiritually connected to them? And that's what Romans chapter four will be about. And Galatians, when you think about the, the argument there, to be a son of Abraham is to come in by faith to believe in the promises of the gospel. That brings you into those blessings. And so a Jew who would really do that would be, according to Galatians 6.16, uh, the true Israel of God, a Jewish person who believes in the Messiah, what beautiful line of reasoning do you suppose, you who judge those, but you practice the very same things, yet do them yourselves, that you will escape the judgment of God. That's just beautiful logic to help people to see their self-deception. I think it's good for us to ask a question, though. Uh, is Paul being judgmental here? Because it kind of sounds like it, right? It's a classic tactic if you're ever out there and you're sharing the gospel with somebody, you start to preach to them and they go, wait a second, that's very judgmental. You're being judgmental towards me. And what's your response? Well, it sounds like you just made a judgment of me. Why is it okay for you to do that? And we could go back and forth all day. So is Paul being judgmental here is a very good question to ask. Remember, we said the Bible hates and God hates self-righteous, hypocritical judgment. Go with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter seven. I don't think the Bible is against 
making judgments as long as they are in line with the scriptures from a life that is meant to be lived by the glory of God, by somebody who's repented and put their faith and trust in God and is striving with their life to be pleasing to him. Matthew 7, 1 to 5, listen to it. It says, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So let's take that logic and apply it to Romans 2. You judge those people because they're practicing those things. Okay, flip that on yourself, O oh man, O oh Israelite. Are you practicing those same things? Then you're going to receive that same standard of judgment. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eyes? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? When there is a log in your own eye, here's the word, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eyes. It's hypocritical judgment that the Bible hates that leads to self-deception and self-righteousness. But can you just write down John 7.24? John 7, 24, listen to Jesus, okay? Same one who just spoke that, John 7, 24, in an argument uh, with um, people. John 7, 24, it was in Luke, there we go. Yeah, John 7, 24, listen to Jesus. And his words here, John 7, 24 says this. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So this is Jesus himself who just said, do not judge, now telling people to judge. But notice the phrase with right or righteous judgment. How do you have righteous judgment? Be in alignment with the scriptures. And for me to be able to say this is wrong, like the prophets of the Old Testament, why was it okay for them to judge the nations of Israel? Because the prophets were not following after idols, they were worshiping the one true God. So it is not hypocritical judgment, what it is for them is righteous judgment and the Bible is okay with that because the person who is doing this the the person like the Apostle Paul or you and I as evangelists when we fight self-righteousness in our own life we're not going to go out brashly to preach the judgment of God but broken heartedly preach the judgment of God if you can honestly take pleasure in telling someone they're going to hell there is something wrong in your heart and I do not think you know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because what did we learn when we talked about the sin of homosexuality? Such were some of you. That's what you were. And if you forget that or what we learned from Titus, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, slaves to pleasure, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and kindness of God came in. So when you guard against self-righteousness, there's no way you're going to come up with hypocritical judgment because your life's going to be in line with what the Bible's telling you to do. And you're going to be brokenhearted as you're preaching this to people. You got to understand the danger of self-righteousness. They think that they are going to escape the judgment of God. They're like the man at the beginning going, I wore the juice. I, I, was, I was a part of the covenant people. That's who I was. Why am I being judged? Because you're doing the same things that bring the judgment of God. We have to understand that as we go out. Be ready to ask these good questions. But look where Paul goes. It's not just good questions that he asks. I love verse four. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So this is going to help us as we go out to make sure that we never go out in self-righteousness and to address the self-righteous person, we have to, number two on our outline, be motivated by God's patience. Be motivated by God's patience. That has to motivate you when you go out and you're a gospel witness. Be motivated by God's patience. We called the sermon the glory of God displayed in his patience. And if you think about that fact, it is so beautiful. 
Because every single one of us knows what it's like to feel wronged. Just think of the last time when you felt justly wronged. Somebody lied to you. Somebody betrayed you. Somebody hurt you. You at that point are in a position of power. And if you had the ability and capability to merit out a judgment and make it happen, I know your heart because I know my own heart. That I would do it in a heartbeat if it was me getting my justice. But you know where I'm very quick to ask for patience is where I'm the one who's wronged somebody. God has never wronged us. He's always the righteous God. And so his wrath, like we talked about from chapter one, is a righteous indignation that hates sin. And the first infraction could be met with God's wrath if he wanted, but he's patient. And that fact should motivate us to never be self-righteous and to go out amidst self-righteous people and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. As you plumb the depths of God and his greatness and his mercy and his kindness and his patience, that should encourage you to worship him. It's so awesome when we can grow in, in the depths of, and knowledge of, of things. Like, I love, I love bacon. I didn't think it was possible to love bacon more, but I grew in my knowledge of bacon this week, okay? Like, not only does bacon, right, it's just a superfood, really. Like, it's probably the greatest food ever invented. It tastes good, right? Makes salads delicious. Dr. Atkins told me it's healthy, so I've got three right here. And then number four, did you know this? They used bacon to make bombs in World War II to defeat the Nazis. Now, if that is not gangster, I don't know what is. You are taking down Nazis every time you're eating bacon. I am plumbing the depths of how much I enjoy bacon. But you know what? There will come a time where I've learned everything that there can be about bacon, and I can't go any further. But it won't be like that with God. God is so glorious and so immeasurably great what does the psalmist say? Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. I now and in eternity am going to enjoy growing in the knowledge of God in this passage. That's what Paul uses, notice this, in his evangelism. So he says this, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness? I love that word, riches. The concept of God for the Apostle Paul is not something small. The concept of God, theology proper for him, is something vast, immeasurable, immense, glorious. It, it is all consuming for him. He uses the word riches because he can't even figure out to talk about the depths of how great it is. In Romans eleven thirty three, 33, he will say, oh, the depths of the riches of the knowledge and wisdom of God. We at Compass Bible Church Tustin, we have these eight distinctives. We try to do prayer, we're committed to prayer. Every week we're committed to expository teaching. Do you know one of them? Maintain a high view of God. That's probably the easiest one that there is if you read the Bible. Because the subject of God is so vast, immeasurable, immense, gigantic, profound. God is all glorious. But notice Paul is using this in his evangelism. How do you use the doctrine of God when you share the gospel? Are you so quick to rush to the benefits? You get this when you get to heaven. You don't go to hell. You get to be with family members who are there. Here's the benefit for you. Here's the benefit for you. Here's the benefit for you. Who is that worshiping? The person you're preaching the gospel to. This right here is the gospel is about God. It is God's gospel. We read that from Mark chapter 1. Paul said it in Romans chapter 1. The gospel of God. It is this vast, immense, glorious God that they are refusing to worship. And these people have knowledge of this God and they're refusing to submit to it. You have to know God more. You have to increase in your love for him if you're going to evangelize this way. If I make it about the benefits for them... I'm going to bring them into the kingdom of God under false pretenses. And when they get to church and they realize church isn't about them, they're going to walk out of here. 
But if I preach a gospel that is God-centered, when we bring them to church and we're hopefully God-centered here, we're going to watch those two things go together. Paul says to these people, he's trying to wake them up, do you presume upon the riches of his kindness, his forbearance, and his patience? I love that. I think that's incredible. To presume, to look down upon, to despise. You remember that phrase in Hebrews 12? Jesus, when he went to the cross for you, what does it say? He despised the shame. So he looks at the shame that's associated with taking on the sin of other people and he goes, that's nothing to me. I don't even care about that. Same word here about the person who is self-righteous. Do you despise the kindness, the forbearance, and the patience of God? See, that means to them they have such a low view of God and a high view of themselves, they're never going to repent of their sins unless that changes. So Paul here is making the switch for them. Do not presume upon this. Now what I think Paul is doing here is I don't know if he's trying to teach a a, a course on systematic theology where he's expecting them to know all of the distinctiveness between the terms and maybe he's just heaping up a lot of synonyms So I don't think he's making great distinctions between each one of them, but there are enough differences for us just to pause for a moment and to make sure that we have a high view of God to consider what each one of these would mean. So uh, kindness, the kindness of God is incredible to think about. Something then we as Christians should have, one of the fruits of the Spirit, is kindness. So when we see that our God is kind, of course, that should be produced in our life. And this kindness of God is often associated with salvation from the wrath of God. Two quick passages, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. Ephesians 2, 4 to 7. Just think about those terms. Starting in verse 3 would probably just be a little bit helpful just so we get the same sort of context. Ephesians 2, 3 through 7. So among whom we all once lived, Paul says, we're all in the judgment of God. We lived according to our passions of our flesh. We carried out the desires of the body and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us up with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Notice when he's talking about the kindness of God in contrast to the wrath of God, immeasurable riches, profound depths, immense theological weighty topic for you. Titus 3, uh, 3 to 7 would say the same exact thing. Even the Hebrew uh, Old Testament, when it's translated into the Greek in the Septuagint, would use this word and it's often translated for the the word uh, tov, for goodness. So kindness of God associated with his salvation is there. The word forbearance is actually only used twice in the New Testament here. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 26, Romans 3, 26, we'll talk about forbearance. We won't spend a lot of time on there because we're going to get there. But simply would mean something like the ending of hostilities, okay? Kind of like when a a truce takes place, there's no more war, ending of hostilities. There's able to be an amicableness, a a peacefulness between the warring fractions because there's a truce between them. Uh, And then third, this one is, is the most profound. And we thought just briefly, touched on it last week, the patience of God. This is very good for you to think about, the patience of God, especially in motivation for evangelism. We talked about this last week. I mean, we think about the patience of God. Just to look at the deceitfulness and the destructiveness and the detestableness of all of mankind's acts against him. He created man to worship him, and God has just been so incredibly patient. But if that patience is mistaken for inactivity or indifference, you're missing out on the worship of God. Like God is just up there unaware of all this going on and one day he's just gonna get tripped and then fire his wrath. That's not how the wrath of God works. He is righteously angry at the sinner every single day. That's what Psalms tell us. 
righteously angry and his indignation burns and it grows. Do you see how it was presented in verse 5? You are storing up for yourself wrath for the day of wrath. You are stockpiling wrath. That's what's happening. So remember, whenever we talk about patience, we always try to make this point. Patience is not the anticipation of blessing, but the, in, in, the endurance of antagonism and, and being antagonized. Like, that's what's happening when you're patient. Somebody is antagonizing you, and you are putting up with it. You are bearing with it. So the phrase in the Old Testament is what? Slow to anger. Let's go to Exodus 32, just to remember this. Exodus 32. Exodus 32, slow to anger. I want you to look at 32, uh, verses 7 to 10. But as you're turning there, remember the context. Moses has gone up on the mountain. He's received revelation from God. The people are impatient and they want to worship something. Again, shows that human beings just crave worship. They've crafted an idol literally days, about 40 days after agreeing to always do what God commanded. They break literally the first two commandments in the golden calf. And look what happens when God sees it. Exodus 32, seven to 10 says this. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Remember, that's the section in Romans that we're talking about. We said glory corrupted. You were created in the image of God to worship God, but because we chose in Adam and Eve to worship ourselves and have been doing that ever since, we corrupted the glory of God. These people, as a paradigm, have corrupted themselves and they've turned aside out of the way that I commanded them and they have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I make a great nation out of you. Is God's wrath just there? Absolutely. To literally make a covenant and have it broken. If you need to know indignation, talk to anybody in a marriage who has been cheated on. That's indignation because you've made a covenant. And it is righteous indignation. This is a covenant. What do you think in the Old Testament? That's what it says to Israel. You've played the whore, is what it says. You've left the marriage. You've committed adultery. That's what Hosea is about. You have cheated on God. And that's what these people have done, and so his wrath is righteous. But you know what God teaches us throughout the rest of the passage? If somebody mediates, if somebody steps in, if somebody intercedes, God will restrain his righteous wrath and allow for repentance. This sets us up for the gospel in the New Testament because that's what Jesus does. He is our propitiation. He is the one who holds back the wrath of God and intercedes for us. And that's what we offer to to people. You're in Exodus 32. Go to Exodus 34. How does God reveal himself? 34, 6, and 7. The Lord, the Lord, passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord is a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who by no means will allow the guilty to go free. That's who we have in our God. Back to Romans chapter 2. So we think about the patience of God. This is, this is the definition we've given it. The patience of God is his powerful restraint of his righteous wrath. Do you realize that when you go to God in the morning and you pray and there is no condemnation on you, that should eliminate any self-righteousness that you have. What does the old hymn say? Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Or my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's why you pray, 
my God. That's why you ask God for great things to happen for his namesake, not because you saved yourself, but because God in the gospel saved you from his righteous wrath, and it happened because he was patient, able to restrain his wrath. You think of something like the Hoover Dam, which is just an incredible man-made construction, and it holds back so much water, the power that it must possess to hold it back. I think at, at its highest point of pressure, it is something like 45,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. It's PSI at its highest point. Per square inch is 45,000 pounds, something to that effect. Let me, you know what, that might not be right. Is what it be? Uh, see, this is what happens when you are not a scientist. Jeremiah, we talked about this before. Okay, was it pounds per square inch or was it tons? It was pounds per square inch? Okay, good, yeah. So I talked to Jeremiah. When I don't know things, I ask Jeremiah. So to give you a visualization of it, think of like a, a school bus. If you took a school bus and you had it balance on something the size of a stamp, that would be pounds per square inch, that much weight being held by something that small and tiny. That's how much power is possessed by the Hoover Dam. It is able to withstand so much pressure because it's such a strong edifice. It takes an omnipotent God to restrain this righteous wrath. So it is Nahum 1.3, if you remember Pastor Matt preached that, God is slow to anger and great in power. That's our God. So when we go out there and we preach a gospel, we save ourselves from self-righteousness because we realize that God has been patient with us. But we plead with them, understand that God is being patient right now, but he will not always be patient. Hebrews tells us what? It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that comes judgment, and you will stand before God, and it will either be on your own merits that you seek to get into eternity, or the merits of Jesus Christ, and that's it. There is no other hope. Do you presume upon this? Do you look down upon it? It's meant to lead you to repentance. Don't store it for yourself more and more wrath. But what's so interesting is Paul says as we're going out and we're gospel ambassadors and we're disciples of Jesus Christ, there's one more thing in this text that we have to get right and it's found in this phrase, do you know that the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance? And for us, as we are gospel preachers and proclaimers, if we match the gospel that Jesus himself preached, the gospel of God, we have to get repentance right. So number three on your outline, be clear on the doctrine of repentance. Be clear on the doctrine of repentance. Guys, we want to do this. We have to get this right. Think about not getting repentance right. If I get partial repentance, I don't get into the kingdom, okay? Let's say you rented a house up in Big Bear, you're going up there, and the house has a six-digit code, and uh, the six-digit code is required to get into the house. If you have three of the digits right, are you getting into the house? No. If you have four of the digits right, are you getting into the house? No. If you have five of the six digits, that's so close. You are almost there. Are you getting into the house? No. Nothing but the full code will get you into the house. It's the same with repentance. I can't just do it partially. I can't sever one part of it and say, I've got this, therefore let me in. I have to have the full Thing. Why? Take a look at this. Knowing that the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance, but because of your hard and impenitent, or literally unrepentant heart, you're storing up for yourselves the day of wrath. So it's juxtaposing the different forms of the type of heart you can have. A hard heart, like the people of Israel, that God was going to judge back in Exodus. Remember, their hard heart, God was going to bring wrath. These people's hard, unrepentant heart will receive wrath, non-negotiable. It is just for the judge to do that. So they have to repent. So we much preach the, the, the true doctrine of repentance. So let's be clear on the doctrine of repentance. Metanoia here in the Greek, meaning another mind, which should make a lot of sense to us, right? What has Paul been talking about this entire time? The Gentiles have a debased mind, which leads them to act. So again, nobody can just say, okay, I'm going to start to do good things if the inside doesn't change. 
So metanoia is another mind, a new mind that must come in, and that must be done through the gospel coming in and awakening you and enlivening you to wanting to know who God is. It is a, another mind. But if you think it's simply just changing your mind, I think you only have half the equation. Because what did we just say? A debased mind, immoral, uh, idolatrous thinking leads to immoral living. So exalted thinking about God would lead to exercising obedience towards him. Because when my mind knows who God is and understands that, now I'm going to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Turn with me to Acts 26. I think this is just a, a great phrase. We uh, did this just uh, recently in Every Day in the Word. We had Mark 1, we had Acts 26. All with the subject of repentance. Listen to Acts 26, 20. Acts 26, 20. Uh, look at verse 19. Acts 26, 19 says this. Paul making his defense before King Agrippa. He says, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, <clears throat> but declared to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the regions of Judea, and also to the Gentiles. Isn't that great? Jew, Gentile, whatever region, I'm preaching the same thing to them. They are falling under the same condemnation and the same way into the kingdom for them. What? That they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. So we have the word repent there, which is metanoia from our text. And also another word for repentance, epistrepho, which shows up, I believe, like 1 Thess 1, 9 and 10, turning to God. Both are speaking of repentance. So Paul is hyping up these terms of repentance on how you get into the kingdom of God. And so Jesus said, his first sermon, Repent and believe to get into the kingdom of God. We have to get the doctrine of repentance right. So letter A on your outline, let's say this. Preach converting repentance. Letter A, preach converting repentance. If you want to get the doctrine of repentance right, you have to think this through. Preach converting repentance. There is a major shift. There is a kingdom altering shift that must go on in your life. And that is the initial repentance that you bring into your Christian life. So I, I wrote on here the reorientation of life toward the lordship of Jesus Christ. So when you are preaching the gospel, you are preaching the doctrine of converting repentance. What that means is this. People's lives are oriented one way towards pleasing themselves. They want to live according to their desires. Romans 1 has laid it out very clearly. You have this idolatrous thinking, and that's why you're doing what you're doing. So preaching converting repentance is, I'm now reorienting my life now, and it's the opposite way. I'm living for the lordship of Jesus Christ. That takes place once, and that is not something that you can flip-flop back and forth on. That happens one time, and when God saves you, he will cause you to endure for his glory. But how will he cause you to endure? Here's letter B, what I want you to have under the doctrine of uh, repentance. Practice consecrating repentance. Practice consecrating repentance. When you think of the word consecrating, uh, sanctify. That's what we're talking about when we're growing to be like Jesus Christ. So as we have reoriented in our lives from living for ourselves to now living for the lordship of Christ, this, every time that I repent as a Christian, which Martin Luther said, the whole life of a Christian is one of repentance, absolutely that's true. But now it's not, I'm always reorienting my life, but I am realigning my life with the lordship of Jesus Christ. And as I realign it, it's because I've gotten off track. I've done something for the flesh. I've committed a sin against God and I need to repent of it. And so I practice that repentance. So maybe the good way to think about it um, would be like a, a driving analogy. I always want to make sure the direction of the car is going where I want it to go and I would like it if my car and wheels were aligned rightly so I get there smoothly, okay? So think about this. I had a, a friend one time huge college football fan, flew to Florida to go watch a football game. And uh, after the football game was over, uh, it was real late, long game, uh, didn't, wasn't from Florida, and there's a huge highway, I-75. Driving from Detroit 
I-75 goes from Florida all the way up to Detroit. You can take it there. I-75, north and south, just two options, one way or the other. I believe his hotel was north of the stadium. And so he gets on the freeway, turns north, about an hour maybe away he was there, and he's like, I should be there. So he starts driving on I-75, and it's like an hour, and he's not noticing his hotel. And it's like an hour and a half, and he still doesn't see his hotel. And it's like two hours now, and he's not seeing his hotel. It's late at night, looks up at the sign. He's on I-75 South, okay? That is the opposite direction of where he needed to go. His hotel was north, he went south. There must be a change of direction to address that problem, okay? Now think through this with me. Let's say my friend was leaving the stadium and it was a rental car and we all know what we do with rental cars, okay? You don't treat them nicely. You, you, you rev that thing up. You see how, how fast you can go. You're gonna test the limits of it because it's not your problem to deal with. So let's just say you've got that rental car. Don't hypocritically judge me. We just talked about that. I know <laughs> you do the exact same thing. So you get this car and you're driving and you notice, oh man, this pulls left. The alignment is way off, okay? You have to like battle, even with power steering, battle just to get the alignment back on. So it's not like a super smooth ride to get there, okay? So that's the car my friend has. He's on I-75 South. If he stops the car and he goes, I'm going to call a mechanic to come deal with the alignment, is that changing his problem? No, because he's going the wrong direction. You can make it as smooth a ride as you want, but until that direction changes, it does nothing. I can be a self-righteous person doing everything morally good, but until my life changes, it's going to do nothing but make my road smoother to hell. Can you think about that for a self-righteous person? They are enjoying their ride toward hell, and we've got to say, you're going the wrong way, and what you're doing will never change that direction. But let's say, by the grace of God, somebody points out that to him, and he goes the opposite way, and he's fixed the problem. Would it be good for him to get an alignment so his ride is smoother and it's easier for him to do what he's supposed to do? That's repentance as a Christian. Now I'm aligning myself, right, because I know the way and I know how this should feel and that must continually happen. Look at what Paul said, and we're still in Acts 26, 20. He says, performing deeds in keeping with repentance that are worthy of repentance, that if you took scales that said, I'm repentant on here with my words, and I'm repentant on here with my actions, and they went together. That's what it means, performing deeds in keeping with repentance. That's what John the Baptist preached. That's what Jesus preached. That's what the Old Testament teaches on repentance. Let's go to one, Isaiah. I love this passage, Isaiah 55. Listen to this, Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Listen to this. This is Old Testament language now for repentance. 55, 6 through 9. It says this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon, forsake and return, Old Testament language for repentance. Forsake, I cut my life off from this way and I now give it to God, I return to him and I follow after him. Now notice this, verse eight, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts than your thoughts and my ways. Uh, your, uh, my thoughts and your thoughts and my ways than your ways. Now, don't take this text to think that this is talking about God's um, immeasurable riches that we can't know and understand. Think about what he just said. Wicked, forsake your way and thoughts because they're not my thoughts and my ways. This is a passage on repentance. And so the question becomes, how can we know your thoughts, God? How can we know your ways? Verse 10, for as the rain and snow come down from heaven but do not re- and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. We know his thoughts and his ways because he gives his word. So practice converting repentance. 
It will show you your inconsistencies and you repent of them and God is gracious and merciful to forgive you of those sins. But you will be just as hypocritical as this Jew if you practice those very same things that you're calling people to repentance for. We must be clear on the doctrine of repentance if we're gonna be great gospel witnesses. God has been so kind to us. He's been so patient with us. He's been so merciful towards us. We of all people should battle self-righteousness because we realize even in our repentant life, we are not perfect. And if we are not perfect, we could never save ourselves. God has saved us. So let us align ourselves more with him, but preach the, the doctrine of the converting repentance that people need to get into the kingdom of God so he gets the glory. Let's pray that he'd give us the grace to do so. Father, thank you for your grace and mercy and patience and kindness that you are slow to anger with us. God, thank you that um, we can meditate on that and think about that this morning. God, would you please be so kind to help us look at your nature and understand that you've been so patient towards us and be thankful towards that. May we sing as people who have received the patience of God and understand it and love it and cherish it. But Father, may we go out and be bold against those who are self-righteous, bold to say, it doesn't matter how smooth your ride is to hell, you're still going there. And God, that you would convert them, that you would open blind eyes, that you would help them to see that they need a savior, that all their righteousness is as filthy rags before you, but you can give them the righteousness of Christ. God, by your kindness, help us to live for you so that we might glorify your name, practicing the doctrine of converting repentance, knowing that you as a gracious father will supply us everything we need to live a life for your glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen.